Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to another Transplant Grand Rounds. I had the pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Richard Formica. Dr. Formica is currently Professor of Surgery and Medicine at Yale University and is also the Medical Director of Transplant Medicine and the Director of the Kidney Transplant Program. Dr. Formica is a Boston-trained physician, undergrad, grad, and postgraduate training at BU, and then moved close to Boston, a little bit south, to uh, Connecticut, where he has been, did his, all his nephrology training at Yale, and has remained at Yale as a, a full-time faculty racing through the ranks. Uh, as you may know, Dr. Formica is the president-elect of the American Society of Transplantation, but he has also been involved in quite a bit of uh, policy making through UNOS and the Kidney Committee, and is going to be talking to us about bias in uh, transplantation, the discard of usable organs that, as you know, is a critical uh, point right now in our access to transplant. Rick? So uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you to Marwan, who will be uh, president of the ASTS when I'm president of AST. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, so what I want to do today is a slightly different talk than maybe you're used to um, have delivered at your grand rounds. And so there's a little background to this title. And at Yale, we have a collaboration with Cambridge University in England, and we go back and forth uh, each year to do conferences. And, and one of the things we do is give each other titles that seem more absurd and harder to talk about. And my colleagues at Cambridge gave me this title and sort of say, well, see what you can do with it. And so I did a quick talk for that. Um, meeting, and as I dug into the topic, I became more interested. So I want to walk you through some of my thoughts on this, and it's, these are thoughts that are evolving as we go. Um, these are my conflicts of interest. There's no financial conflicts whatsoever, and these fiduciary conflicts are not going to affect the conversation whatsoever. Okay, so what is the fundamental problem that we have in transplant, and it's that organ discard rate is starting to, it's exceeding re this um, organ recovery. And this is a paper from Darren Stewart. He published this about two and a half years ago. And it's basically just a survey of, of what's been going on. And if you look over here, this is the actual number of organs recovered. And, and the number of organs recovered has been increasing each year. But the bigger problem is the number of organs discarded. So back in the in the um, 1980s, there was 394 organs discarded. Most recently, we're up to about 2,800 organs discarded per year. And that number has remained stable, really, for the last decade. So we're throwing away almost 3,000 kidneys a year. And that's bad enough in and of itself. But if you look at the rate of rise of organ discards, we're up to 19%. And you look at the rate of rise of organs that are recovered, it's not rising at the same rate. And if you were to say, well, we're just recovering higher KDPI organs, and those are the organs that are being discarded, it doesn't, the math doesn't work. In fact, a larger number of organs, numerical number of organs are discarded in the KDPI 35 to 80 group, actually, right? So, so there's a disconnect in the discard rate and the organs that we're recovering. Okay, so this is Jean Piaget. He's a cognitive theorist. I'm here to tell you I am not a cognitive theorist and I don't pretend to be one, although I liked his glasses, right? So I thought, hey, that's a cool way to go. Um, but, but the people I've been reading, and one person I recommend to you all if you're interested is, is a uh, Duke uh, econ economist named Dan Airely. And if some of you have read his stuff and read, watch his blogs, you may see some similarities to um, to this talk. So the first thing is I'm going to challenge you and say I bet most people in this room feel that they are very rational and they really weigh the options and they think their decisions through carefully. Okay. So let's start off with a thought experiment. 
Anybody recognize what these are? This is called shepherd's tables. And by a sh with a show of hands, which table is longer? Is it this table? Everybody hands up. OK, that's the longer table. Or is it this table? Some people think that's the table. The reality is they're exactly the same. And the reality is I am so proud of being able to do that with a slide on my own. Right? <laughs> I've got a nurse who makes all my slides for me, and I did that on my own. Okay, so, so clearly, I'll take that away, right? Even though, even though you just saw that, you just can't see it, no matter how much you want to, okay? Let's do another one. What color is the top arrow pointing at? What's, what's color? Brown, would people say brown? You know, this is where you could be colorblind. And what color is the bottom arrow pointing at? Orange, right? I see that too. The reality is, and you're going to have to trust a little bit on this one, those are actually the same color as well. They're the same exact color. You can't see it because of the shadowing and the ways your eyes view this. Um, and if you want a little more, this is an interesting article from the BBC. You just can't see that. You haven't learned anything in the past five minutes that so we've talked. You can't see it. And you can't see it. So think about this. Your brain is Vision is something you do every day, and you've done it your whole life. The largest portion of your brain is dedicated to vision, and you still make mistakes. Right? So it seems logical to me that you're going to make mistakes in things you do less commonly, like making decisions, like you know, managing your finances. Right. So our intuition is fooling us. And it fools us in consistent and very predictable ways. It's almost the one thing you can count on is that your decision making is going to be influenced by things that aren't exactly right. So look at this road. And I'd say to you that we all recognize our physical limitations, right? I'm 5'6". When I organize my shelf, I don't put the things I want at the very top. It's just not efficient. I can't get there, right? We design bicycles. We design shoes. We design roads with the idea that not everybody is a perfect driver, right? You give yourself a guardrail. You've got a little curbing. The road is wider than it needs to be because people don't drive perfectly. So why don't we give the same consideration when we're designing tools that we use to make decisions? We all assume that we are superhuman decision makers and we're completely rational. Okay, so keep that notion as we go forward of having a tool that can help compensate for our deficiencies. And I think this slide, this little cartoon, actually sums up most of us during the day. We have objective facts, we have what confirms our predetermined beliefs, and that gives us what we see as we go forward. And it's called bias, OK? So then you can ask yourself, well, what is it? Why do smart people make bad decisions? Because everybody in this room is smart. But you're still, as, and I am as, vic as guilty of this as anybody else, susceptible to making bad decisions. And this is an interesting paper. It, it, it was focusing on the economic downturn in 2008. And this, this uh, social psychologist here points to these red flags for bad decisions. And, and in this article, he talks about attachments, self-interest, misleading experiences. That's actually one of the biggest, and prejudgments. But what they really all summate to is bias, OK? And so I think prior to us developing strategies to reduce the number of discards, we actually need to figure out why it's happening in the first place. And I think from what I've done in, in the policy perspective, uh, with UNOS, we haven't really done this. We've come up with all these algorithms and ways to try to reduce discharge, but nobody's actually sat back and said, well, why is this happening in the first place? What's, what's the reason? And if we know the reason, then we can back engineer the way to fix the problem. So the first observation I would make to you is humans crave information, right? So this is Maslow's triangle, his hierarchy of needs. This is actually the more complex one. I don't think he ever envisioned Google, Facebook, or Twitter, right? Like, we need information more than we need all of these other things, right? And you see that every single day with people, with their cell phones, et cetera. But the, here's the issue. So there's this concept of too many choices 
can make it hard for you to make a decision. And the idea really goes down to like if you present somebody with three jelly options or six jelly options, the three jelly option person is more likely to make a choice and walk out of the store with jelly, right? And I will tell you in fairness, when you try to dig it up, you can find all these examples, but when you do a large meta-analysis, it doesn't entirely show the effect. But I think we've all seen this in reality. And the question is, can too much information make a decision more difficult? Okay, and that, that was the question that I started to ask myself. Is more information a bad thing? Because most people would say more information is a good thing. So then I asked myself, well, why do you want more information? Okay, and that led me to it, this article um, by this guy, uh, he's really, I'm, this is maybe his postdoc, but this guy Shafir does a lot of writing on this topic, right? And he identifies two types of information. And as you're thinking about organ acceptance for the surgeons in the room, think about this concept. Okay, type one is relevant information. And it's information that affects a decision in a subtle way. So example, I want to go fishing. I want a weather report to know if it's going to rain because if it rains, I'll take a raincoat. Okay, it's relevant information as opposed to instrumental information. I want to go fishing. If it's going to rain, I'm not going to go fishing. Okay, that's in from instrumental information. It alters my decision. Okay, that's good. That, that's self-explanatory. But what he found was the pursuit of relevant information can make it instrumental. The very fact you go seeking a piece of Relevant information, suddenly you attach more value to it than it should be. Example, you're accepting an organ. Clinically, the organ sounds great. Eh, I kind of want to get the biopsy just to see. And the biopsy comes back with 23% glomerular sclerosis. It had really no bearing on your first decision, and now it's become instrumental and you don't accept the organ. The clinical story hasn't changed, right? So that's how that could affect what we do every day. And this is what Warren Buffett said. I thought this was is very um, apropos to this topic. The best thing we are, the best thing we do, is that we take all new information and we make sure our prior conclusions remain intact. Right? And just think about how you go through the day. That's kind of representative of what we do. Okay, so let's start to dig into this in a little bit of a, a more sequential way. So I said to myself, what, what, what decisions we make, what what information do we get that could be susceptible to bias? And I sort of then walked the talk through. And just for the purposes of this talk, I chose the kidney donor profile index, the biopsy findings, and what others think, right? But I think you could really go through this and, and dig a lot deeper. Okay, so why do we discard uh, organs? This is old work from Darren. This remains current. Across the bottom, KDPI, this is the percent of organs discarded. And you can see, not unexpectedly, as the KDPI goes up, the number one cause of discard is biopsy findings. I find this one kind of interesting, this list exhausted. List exhausted, maybe what others think. I don't know. Uh, the KDPI itself is a reason for discard. So you see this sort of rapid increase in the discard rate as these KDPI numbers go up but yet two-year survival that is predicted to be quite good. And notice that this, this increase and in rise in KDPI, this is not the 85 to 100% group, right? This is kind of down in the 60 to 70 range. So we're starting to throw these organs away, and these are organs that should be working well, at least for somebody. Okay, and what's the big issue with these high KDPI kidneys? It's really this. It's a trade-off. You can't have it both ways. You're not allocating a high KDPI kidney to somebody because you expect it to last a long time. Your a priori decision was, I'm gonna put a patient on the list for a high KDPI organ because I want them to get it faster. So then why do you get the offer? Then do you decline it because of quality and you're worried that it's not gonna last as long? Your first decision was it's there for a reason and you haven't followed through on it, right? So let's, let's just walk through KDPI for a second. I think probably most people in this room are going to, will understand it, but I bet a lot of people haven't read the fine print. And the fine print is actually 
part of the story, right? So it starts with the KDRI. For those in the room who haven't read the article, it's in Rao and Transplantation. And what you can see is the KDRI takes a whole bunch of factors, including some sort of a, the recipient, and comes up with a score. And the score predicts survival. And if you look at those survival curves, this is the KDRI divided by quintile with the lowest number, so the lower the KDRI, the better the survival of the kidney. So the lowest, the quintile has the best survival, and as you break these up by quintile, survival gets progressively uh, worse, okay? One thing I wanna point out, because it's relevant for the next slide, this bottom quintile, that's a KDRI of greater than 1.45, okay? So you need to just keep that number in mind for the next slide. So why do I walk you through that? Again, it's all about fine print of these things. So the KDRI, when he published this paper, this survival, I'm gonna read it word for word, each survival pertains to a recipient who is aged 50, I like those patients, right? Non-diabetic, I really like those patients, and, and at the reference level for all other recipients, right? So it's not that the KDRI is gonna work well in your patient, it's predicting the kidney survival in a very generic, very idealized patient. And it's actually quite powerful because this is, this is that top quintile divided up into quintiles. So it really does work to talk about kidneys that will last. Okay, so what is the KDRI of the kidneys that we recover? Okay, now remember that 1.45 I asked you to remember. So all, most of the kidneys we recover are in that higher quintile just to begin with, just to begin with alone, okay? So we're already recovering the best of the best, and we're still throwing them away, okay? Now, this is like, you know, schoolhouse rock when we were growing up. So how does KDRI become a KDPI, right? And this is important to know. So the, every year, the previous year's organs that were recovered for transplant are set out in a line from the best to the worst, and that sets the KDPI for the next year, right? So if an organ was recovered that last year, it'll be in the KDPI this year. If you never even recover the organ, that KDRI doesn't factor in. And what does that mean? And this, uh, when, we, when I was on the kidney committee, we marched this forward. A KDPI kidney today of 80 is a better kidney than a KDPI kidney of 85 years ago. Because if the organs are never recovered, they don't get factored in. So there's been a, a, a migration towards ever better kidneys because they never get factored in, okay? And even the KDPI, I'm gonna just, just example that to you, has a problem in the fine print. So here is, this is the survival curves. These are estimated survivals, so they're not perfect, right? They're one and two year survivals, and you'll see that, you know, even for high KDPI kidneys, it's pretty good, right? But again, the fine print shows you that these, this, is, this is based upon a predicted and stylized patient. It doesn't say to you that it's the KDPI survival in your patient. It's the KDPI survival or the survival of a kidney in a generalized patient, right? So when you talk about the C statistic being weak for KDPI, that's not a problem with the KDPI. It's saying that some recipients of a high KDPI offer do really well, and some recipients of a low KDPI offer do really poorly, right? It doesn't talk about the kidney. It talks about the recipients we're putting these kidneys into. Okay, and lastly, before we get into some of the biases, data actually supports using these organs, right? So here you go, these are the KDPIs by decile. This is that classic wolf survival curve we've all become comfortable looking at. Here's where you break evil and risk, even in risk, and here's where you break even in, in survival. And you see that when you use these organs, even just to break risk, the time to equal likelihood of death is still measured in months. Okay, measured in months. And the organs don't have to last all that long till the patient you put them into is likely to receive a survival benefit from them, right? Remember, organ failure is a fatal disease. Anything that you can do to forestall death in our patients is a good thing. It might not be the optimal duration, but anything is better than the alternative. 
Okay, so why do we decline so many high KD PI kidneys? And so one of the first types of biases when you start to read through this is something called framing. Okay, so framing. So what's a simple way to explain framing? If I told you something contains 20% fat, or if I told you something was 80% fat free, which one would you pick? A fat free one, right? Why wouldn't you pick fat? So, okay, so now how, how am I gonna link this to an organ offer? Okay, so here we go. We're gonna, we're gonna do, a, do a little role playing here and this is something I don't do well. Remember our recipient, because I wanna come back to our recipient in a later slide to use as an example. But he's a 55-year-old guy, his blood type is O, eight-year wait at Yale, he's diabetic, hypertension, peripheral vascular disease, and he's only got two years of dialysis exposure. So he's just at the beginning of his journey. And the organ offer is this, 65-year-old, hypertension, not diabetic, not hep C, terminal creatinine of 1.2, and for the purposes of this little role play, KDPI is 87%. Okay, so framing number one, and I'm your nurse coordinator calling you at night, okay? Hi Marwan, how you doing? I've got an organ offer for our patient, and it looks really good. He's 85 years old, uh, 65 years old, but he only has hypertension for 10 years. Not, not a diabetic, not hepatitis C, and his creatinine is 1.2. Versus, hi, I'm sorry to wake you up. It's a KDPI offer of 87. The patient, six, the donor is 65 years old and has had hypertension for 10 years and he's died of a stroke, right? You can frame this presentation in a way that you get the decision you want. And I know it because my nurse coordinators manipulate me all the time to get what they want, right? It's all in the way they, it just happened to me as I was working on this slide, right? We got this non-directed offer and Sharon calls, you know, you remember Sharon, right? Sharon calls me up and she's like, you know, I just want you to know we got this non-directed offer but you know, the recipient's hepatitis C and he's got, he's, you know, NASH and there's no biopsy and we're not gonna take the offer, right? I'm like, oh no, we're not gonna take the offer. So it happens all the time, you know it. And it's important to recognize it go forward, okay? Okay, second question is, does the context matter? Okay, so let's, another one of these little mind games, right? So in your mind, read these down, okay? Now read them across, okay? So the context matters, right? The context that the information is presented to you makes a difference in how you make a decision. So if you're talking about accepting a high KDPI organ and this is your imaginary line, right? The context of being at the front of the line, right? You've listed this patient for high KDPI organ and now they're at the front of the line and you say to yourself, oh, should I take this low organ? But they're gonna get the next offer, so should I wait? It's sort of like gambling, right? Like, Bird in the, you got the bird in the hand, two in the bush sort of thing. Is the next kidney coming really better? You don't know, but you say, I'm gonna wait. Versus if you're back here, you say, well, it makes sense. You're at the back of the line. In this context, it makes sense. But here's the thing, and this is a relatively new paper that's recently out by Sumit Mohan. He actually asked a very smart question. He said, what is your mortality after you decline your first organ offer? And it goes up astronomically. And actually, in a somewhat embarrassing fashion in Connecticut, like, you're really in trouble if we decline an organ off, right? And these are like real odds ratios. Like, this is like, you know, for whatever reason, Maine is like the reference point. I live in New England all my life. That, that surprises me a little bit. But anyways, um, you know, and like, you have significant mortality if you just decline one organ offer. Right? Pe I don't think people think about that. And I want to come back to that at a later date. Okay, are we subject to the hurting effect? Okay, so I like to use comedy, it helps keep people awake. I thought this is kind of funny. Wait a minute, something feels wrong. Shut up, moron, you do what you're told, right? So you're sort of going along with the flow. I think this happens. So, but here's a question for you. Is information about the pos patient's position on the match run, does that affect your reasoning when you accept an organ offer? If New York has turned it down, why are you getting the offer? That would be the rationale, right? That's the rationale in Connecticut all the time. If Lloyd's not using it, what's going on? Okay, so this is actually something um, that we've studied. And this actually came out of a cocktail hour at SEAT. And we said the very simple question was, if you mask the position of the patient on the match run, 
Does it affect organ offer acceptance? That led Brian Shepard to start what they call now UNOS Labs. And UNOS Labs is a, a cognitive science-based way to do research to affect organ offers. And the first thing we did, and I was part of this uh, initial uh, pilot group, is we just started sending out. When you signed up, you would just be going through your day, your phone would go off, you'd get an organ offer, you'd read it, and you would decide whether or not you would accept it or decline it. And all they did was alter the information that you were given. Right? It's like you've got some pieces of information and you didn't get other pieces of information. And we tried to figure out how that affected organ offers. And the concept would be sort of like this. So m imagine this is my Yale patient. First two patients are highly sensitized, perhaps, and it falls down to us. This guy's not ready. Uh, this patient I can't get in touch with. This patient's got cardiovascular disease. So now I'm making the decision down here for this patient, and I'm saying, why did 22 people ahead of me decline this organ offer? There's got to be something wrong with it, right? And I don't know why they declined it. And all you get are these generic codes and nobody really puts any thought into anyway. So it's, it doesn't really mean much, right? That was the concept. So here's our pilot study, right? So this is, and this was myself, it was Lloyd Ratner and a couple of folks who all knew what was going on. And even in that, even in our little group, when you started to, this is like the baseline donor net information. This is like you hide the OPO name. This is you hide the, the, the turn down code, et cetera. We got this, you know, idea that maybe the more information you withheld, you would get, you know, more acceptances. But it didn't by any means come to be significant. So then we said, okay, we enrolled a bunch of physicians, of 64 of them, as part of the study protocol, not entirely knowing what we're doing, and we did it again, right? And again, we did not determine statistical significance, right? So here's the control group. Here's if you hide the sequence number in the prior refusals. What did you get? You have this slight increase in uh, organ acceptance and everybody from a scientific point said, ah, no big deal. And a couple of us said, wait a minute, what's going on, okay? Remember, these are all the same organ offers and you have acceptance rates that are in the 20s and as high as 100%. So all of us as colleagues sitting around are having a widely divergent opinion about whether these organs should be accepted. And what you really don't see in this slide, and remember this huge spread, is this. A lot of the centers that we tested had two physicians or surgeons in the same center getting the same offers, and even within the same center, physicians had widely divergent opinions about whether or not they're going to accept an organ. Right? You're all working together, you're thinking alike, you're discussing things alike, and you're still coming up with all these different decisions about whether or not you're going to accept an offer. Right? Okay, uh, are we influenced by confirmation bias? And I think this is an important one. So am I susceptible to it? Absolutely, you bet. So I thought that was kind of funny. Okay, so here's our potential donor again, and I'm going to take you down to this glomerular sclerosis. And this is not going to be a discussion about the validity of biopsies. That's a whole other topic. There's a paper coming out uh, sponsored by the ASTS sort of looking at biopsies. We're just going to talk about how you use it to make a decision. So my first question to you is, we all use this. Has anybody gone back and tried to figure out where this comes from? And this comes from Osama Gaber back in 1995. And he wasn't actually trying to make a decision about whether or not you were going to use the organs. He was trying to decide whether or not there was going to be DGF. That was all they were worried about, right? And in this group, right, this, this sclerosis, they found that if you broke these individuals down by group, no sclerosis, 1 to 19% and greater than 20%, the, high, you know, the group that had the highest sclerosis had the highest percentage of delayed graft function, okay? What you also need to know is they only had to have 10 glomeruli present in the biopsy to come up with this percentage. So 10 glomeruli, two are sclerosed, you're at an increased risk of DGF. That's what that comes from, okay? Canadians came along, they do it better. They actually counted more biopsies, 199, and they actually came up with 20 glomeruli uh, that they counted. To understand this chart, you have to take a minute. On this, on this axis is the odds ratio for graft failure, getting closer to what we want, not DGF, but graft failure. 
This is actually the p-value. And what you can see is when you get to a p-value of, of, um, of 0 0.05, you had to be counting almost 25 glomeruli to get to that number and to get to the degree of glomerular sclerosis. And actually what they found was the degree of arteriolar hyalinosis was more predictive. And remember that when we go to the next thing. So okay, so now we, now we have good data. It says if you have glomerular sclerosis, it predicts graft failure. We should be making good decisions based upon the fact that we have glomerular sclerosis. The problem is, who's giving you the information? Well, it's your Banff pathologist, right? It's your pathologist. So this is a great study. You have to read it. Anybody part of this study? I was giving this lecture at Breckenridge, and a guy stands up in the front row, and he says, you know, I'm not on that paper. I was like, oh, God, that's bad thing, right? But here you go. This is 32 Banff, Banff pathologists given blinded slides to look at and read. And they look at something called the ICC, and it's like inter, interclass correlation, okay? An interclass correlation, a perfect score would be one. Every single pathologist reads the slide the same way. And then you can see here, if you're greater than 75%, it's excellent, five, you know, 0.5 to 75, good, et cetera. The one thing these 32 pathologists could do with even a sort of degree of similarity was count the number of glomeruli. Not whether they were sclerotic, not whether it was that they could just count the same number, right? So as you're using this, this piece of information that you've attributed all this significance to, you got to understand it's highly variable, okay? And I want to put this up here just to show you that they did other things. They looked at both core and wedge, frozen and paraffin embedded, okay? So then you go on to something called the Ramuzi score, and I've heard this being used a lot. And the first thing you need to know is the Ramuzi score is actually just to determine whether or not you put organs in as two for ones versus not. It doesn't have anything to do with organ usability, but now we're using it for organ usability, right? It's got to be better because it's much more complicated. That makes it better as well. And you look in this area right here, this is the meat of the action, this interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. Remember the Canadians showed us that that was better than just counting sclerotic glomeruli, right? The other thing that you have to know about it, this is probably all H&E staining, not, not frozen stains. And so just remember this thing right here. So when you start looking at people and our pathologists reading these scores, they're even worse, right? So we've started to use all this significance. We've, uh, we've let our, our belief and our biases about biopsies being real things. And we know that biopsies are the leading cause of discard. And yet, if you look at what we're basing that on, the data that's there is actually very flimsy. Okay, so can we escape something called the availability heuristic? So what's that? That's my availability. If you don't know about it, you can't be affected by it. But in reality, what it is, it's the most recent thing that happened to you, you, you attach an undue significance to. For me, we had these two uh, window period transmissions of HCV. Of course, they occur on a Friday night, so then you're spending all night figuring that out. So here's our potential donor, and we found with a needle in the arm, and I'm remembering that last event. How is that affecting my decision making? So I think everybody knows this. I'm just going to put this so everybody, we're all talking the same language. There is an increased risk in PHS. We all know that in region one, it's almost 40% of the organs we recover our PHS increased risk. It's almost, I'm almost to the point, I think we should just like universal precautions, right? Remember when those of us who practiced during HIV and we just made the decision that we assumed everybody's infected and we behave that way. I think we should assume every organ is increased risk because in reality it is and we should just behave that way, but that's a different conversation. Okay, so the question is, does that label bias against use of the organs? And there's actually a pretty interesting study, and I don't want to overstate the power here, but here, these are all SCD organs. These are not high risk from the high KDPI type organs. It's adult and pediatric. I believe the, the peds are here, the adult is here. These would be uh, PHS organs, the dark bar, and the light bar is non-PHS. And you can actually see that there is less utilization of comparable organs when you put that PHS label on it. And that's probably not too surprising to anybody, and I don't think that's going to get anybody excited. I thought this figure was the most informative. 
This shows the utilization of PHS organs across donor service areas, right? And you may look at where you draw the median line here, and you may say, well, it's about 75%, and that seems not unreasonable. What I saw was, look at this heterogeneity, right, across these DSAs. It goes from a low of 20% to a high of 95%. Like, that's, you know, if everybody was 75%, I'd say, okay, fine. But look at the heterogeneity across different DSAs and the utilization of this. Something else is going on, okay? Now, remember our patient, he was that 55-year-old guy, and we're like worrying about getting him infected with an infectious disease. Have you ever asked what's going to happen to him as he sits on your list and waits? Right? There's a tool on the SRTR for you to do this. This is Yale New Haven Hospital. This factors in our acceptance rates. So this is actually me. This is what I'm doing to patients. And you can go in and you put in the different characteristics. And our guy at five years, he's been on the wait list for two years. He's got a, a chance of getting his kidney of only 10%. He's got a chance of being dead or off the list of 70%. And he's only got a 20% chance of still waiting. And this is at five years after two years on the waiting list. So he's not even to his eight years at Yale, which gets him his organ offer, OK? And if you make him 65, his chance of actually getting an organ offer actually goes down to only 5%, right? That's what the patient is facing. That's the other side of that PHS increased risk. And I think it's important because you want to start talking about risk and biases to patients in ways that they can understand, right? So it turns out if you're on dialysis, hemodialysis, you've got a chance of getting hepatitis C of 0.34% per year, okay? It's 3.4 per 10,000. Remember that number per 10,000. I put it up there for a reason. Okay, so then if you want to talk about that risk relative to all these other things that get us, in, that get us concerned, we, we have a bias towards these, these organs are scary because they come with this infectious risk. Well, what's the actual risk? So over here, and this is, this is my editorializing with this less, this is, the reference is HCV, so a missed HCV infection, and we're comparing it to the hemodialysis risk, okay? And this is the characteristic of the donor who you're seeing, right? So this would be a, a homosexual relationship. The risk of missed HCV is 10 times less than if you stay on dialysis. And you can walk this through, and the big, the take home message is with the exception of an injection drug user in the window period, everything is dramatically less in terms of HCV infection. And HIV infection, the one that we're really worried about these days, is a log order less, right? These are vanishingly small risks. Now, let me ask you this question How many of you drove to work today? Hands up. How many of you? weighed the risk of driving to work today versus not coming to work? Nobody, right? And why didn't you do it? You didn't do it because you have to go to work. You, well, you know, presumably. You have to go to work. You don't have a choice. But you never thought about the risk, right? The same person sitting on dialysis has to get a transplant. He doesn't have a choice. But yet your lifetime chance of dying in an auto accident is 90 per 10,000. Your chance of getting hepatitis C on dialysis is 3.4 per 10,000 per year. And everything else we talked about is a log, a log order less. So your big risk was getting up this morning and coming to work. It wasn't actually getting a hepatitis C or a HIV infected organ, okay? And I think it gets down to this notion, and it, I think we're all biased in this way, of this concept of active versus passive harm to patients, right? And they hear this all the time. Ooh, I prevented the bad outcome from this patient by not giving them that bad organ offer, okay? I'd be willing to bet that people rarely say this. Boy, I just put him at risk by turning down that organ offer because now he's on dialysis another day, right? And the reality is this. Now, I've I took this from the USRDS. It is a adjusted risk, right? So we're not talking about apples and oranges. We're talking about apples and apples. And no matter what you do, transplanting somebody who's a transplant candidate dramatically lowers their risk of death compared to staying on dialysis. It doesn't matter the organ you put into them. You've made their life 
proportionately better by just giving them a transplant. And finally, this is one of those you're sort of reading along and something hits you in the face and you think, I gotta share that with folks. What is the risk of not of declining the, the, the increased risk offer? Well, this is not gonna surprise anybody, right? So this is mortality rate for those who decline the offer. This is the mortality rate for those who accepted the offer, right? Not surprising the way I've been talking, it's a lower mortality rate if you accept the offer. Just like the other thing, the, the actual time you have to have that kidney work to start to realize the benefit is measured in months, okay? And we could stop there, but then you're sort of reading the fine print and you come across this statement, right? So you decline this increased risk offer for, for a patient and they're fortunate enough to get the next offer, okay? The patients who declined the increased risk offer declined a kidney with a KDPI of 20, 21%. That's the kidneys you put into kids. That's how good those kidneys are. And those that got an offer and accepted it took a kidney with an average KDPI of 52%, right? So think about, what the, think about the trade off we just made for this individual. And this has led myself and Sharon, we've, we have a paper coming out in Jason, and one of the arguments we're trying to say is in the absence of utility, you can't have equity. If we're not using these organs, if we're not making all these organs used to their best, we're not even having a conversation about equity. If you're in a situation of rationing and there's not enough to go around until you can make the best use of what you got, let's not even talk about equity as a moot point. Okay, so I want to conclude with a couple thoughts. So I think bias exists as we've talked about it and it negatively impacts the decisions that we make as physicians. I also think you can't get away from it. And I just, I touched on some things and I recommend that you, it's actually some fascinating reading. It all goes down, it's in behavioral economics. There's a lot of TED Talks on it. It's actually kind of interesting and they sort of walk you through it. So I, you can't get away from it. The best thing you can do is know that it exists and plan for it. Think about the way you're designing your road. Okay, so therefore, the way we get around this is we should be removing physician decision making from the, from the process. Everybody's gonna go, oh, I don't like that idea. Okay. But let's go to this. So this is a quote from Dan Early. So behavioral economics, um, from, a, from that perspective, people are fallible and limited. You have to accept that. We are, but we're innovative and adaptable. So for instance, we build these cars, we build shoes, and we complement our physical capabilities, right? And if we apply the same way we think to the other things we do, and frankly, your, our bigger personal problems are the way we're managing our money, the way we're thinking about our health insurance stuff, but if we thought about organ allocation policies as well as something that we know we do poorly and we're designing a policy to compensate for our flawed decision making, we might actually make these tools we can use, which leads me to my last slide. So if you want less biased decisions, use algorithms, okay? Now, there's probably somebody in this room saying algorithms are designed by humans Humans have biases, therefore algorithms are biased. And that is true. And if you read through this article, it is 100% true. The difference is when you use an algorithm that has a bias built into it to help you make your decisions, it is still better than all of us sitting around with our biases and differentially applying them based upon whether it's the weekend versus not the weekend, as, as Lloyd Ratner showed us in his weekend study, right? We all have these other things that come into play, so we would still do better if all we did was say, generate a computer algorithm, this organ for this patient, yes or no, and we don't do any thinking about it. So with that, I'll end, and I'll take questions if it's generated some controversy. Or comments, or tell me why I'm wrong. Maybe I can start with the first question. First, this is an amazing, terrific presentation. Although your Venn diagram with the facts and what you see remind me of a question my wife asked me: Does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> I sort of thought about that before I answered. Uh, the question is that what we all encounter, which is uh, the SRTR rating and the one-year outcome. How does the bias factor into what we think is fact is that you're walking down the fine line and you actually don't know how wide is that fine line is. And how does that factor into decision making? Well, so that's that's so that's another great example of bias, right? So 
So the, the argument would be this. I'm worried about my, my SRTR ratings and I'm worried about getting flagged. Therefore, I'm going to accept lower risk organs because I will get a better outcome. We all do that, right? But both Jesse Schold and Dori Segev have shown us that is biased thinking, right? And it's biased thinking because you're forgetting that you get risk adjustment. And what you're not accounting for is Henry Ford might do a really good job managing higher risk individuals and organs. And therefore, when you get the risk adjustment, you do better, right? When you remove those risky organs, you become susceptible to chance. And Millie and I were talking about that uh, earlier today. Like, so we were going along at Yale, and I had this five-tier rating, and I was like, wow, this is great. I started talking to the hospital administration about it. But in the back of my mind, I knew the only reason we had it is all those chance things that happened. Like, I got away with a cohort where it didn't happen. It's all it was. And there was regression to the mean, and it was going to happen. And it started happening when a live donor recipient took a left turn across traffic. Boom, I lost one graft. And then it all went, all the random stuff came back. It just came back at once. So I think that actually is a perfect example of how we use bias. We think we're reducing risk because we're risk averse, and there's actually a risk averse bias. If, you, if actually you go online and read about biases, you come up with like some astronomical number of different biases, right? You can, you can almost name your own. You have, a, I have the Groucho Marx bias, you know? If they don't want it, I don't want it, you know, that sort of thing. But, um, it's, it's your risk averse, you think you're doing something that's actually protecting you, and it's because you don't see the other frame of reference which is you're making your life worse. And then we got burned. Yeah. Exactly. And then the equity is the fact that the, you give a good patient, even if you give them a kidney in our mind that would not increase their sort of expected survival to 25 years, the benefit of taking a patient off dialysis for, let's say, four years, regardless of their age, is substantially higher than keeping them on dialysis Without a transplant. Sure. And I, I think that's the, the thought process that we need to change, at least in the nephrology community. And uh, to that end, forget biases. What do you think about pulsatile perfusion in these transplants when you, it, it gives you more of a physiological information about how that kidney may or may not do, regardless of what the bias. So I think, you know, this is where I defer to my colleagues at Yale. That our surgeons accept the organ offers. They, we talk about them, but they're the ones who make the choices. They actually feel that, that pressures on the pump after two to four hours of being pumped is a better marker for what they're looking for. So their experience goes that way. I would be lying to you if I was trying to tell you the literature on the predictability of that, and I wouldn't want to go into that that area. Because of that. But you said something else that I think needs to be talked about. So when I'm talking about using algorithms, I'm not talking about substituting physician judgment for things like transplant suitability, right? Because we don't have the ability to tell what patient, at least algorithmically. I, I, frankly, yeah, we started to use our EPIC system to do that. But we're not there. So you still have to sit down and make a decision about what patient you think clinically is going to do better or to do worse. The only thing that I tell my, my you know, colleagues about is when you're in an environment of, of scarcity, right? there's many more people needing an organ transplant than are going to get it. And you, by definition, you have death on the waiting list. So by definition, we are rationing a, uh, a scarce resource and it's a healthcare resource. 
We can make any decision we want, but let's not pretend that every decision we make has another you know, conflicting decision or an outcome. So you put somebody on the list, somebody else is not going to get transplanted. You have to keep that in mind when you're making these decisions. So like the one thing I don't let people do is, well, let's put them on the list to give them hope. You know, I'm not a bad guy. I, I want people to have hope, but I can't do that. That's not appropriate. They've got to be appropriate for transplant, right? And you start walking backwards from there to get to the individuals. Because when I was running the kidney committee, I, my bias personally is I would transplant every kid before I transplanted an adult. Because, you know, kids haven't lived yet. We've all lived our certain lives. And, you know, that would be my preference. I'm not arguing for that point. But, but then I said, okay, if you t in any given year, if you took every kidney that was recovered and you started transplanting from the very youngest to the oldest, you run out of kidneys at like, you know, 52-year-olds, right? So that doesn't quite work, right? So you can't entirely do that. But I think we have to just acknowledge the fact that we are in a, in a, a practice of scarcity and every decision we make has a contravening decision that goes the opposite way for somebody else. And I don't think we think about that a lot, and that's what I'd like to do. So, question. Um, CMS just <coughs> had announced recently that they're going to drop the one-year outcomes. On reevaluations. Uh, judging or deciding on transplant centers with condition of participation. And our societies are trying to extend that to the OPPN. Do you think this would impact the algorithmic decision-making that physicians do have when they're accepting organs? Well, the first thing I would say is um, it, I, it's true they, they re, 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 uh, one year patient graft survival for organ re program recertification is gone. Still, if you're starting a new program, you have to show that, right? My, my first question is, so what are they going to put in its place? <laughs> because I've yet to meet a governmental organization or regulatory body that's actually given up its ability to regulate, right? So there's another shoe to drop, and we don't know what shoe's going to drop just yet, which is why I think the metrics committee is important, because we should be defining this and not having it put upon us. Would it affect the way we, we make decisions? Uh, I think it would to the extent that you wouldn't be de if. If you actually step back, when myself and Lloyd Ratner talk about something called brevity matching, and the reason I'm going on this excursion is that if you look at the problem with outcomes, it's both a combination of the organ you take and the recipient you used to put it into. So you've got to be right on two decisions. And the populations look decidedly different between programs, even when you risk adjust everybody, right? Because it's hard to risk adjust recipients, and it's particularly hard to risk adjust recipients in their cardiovascular disease because we don't capture that, right? If we had a more um, consistent way of deciding who gets what, then it would be easier to compare apples to apples. So for example, we talk about a concept of brevity matching and using, an alg using a formula like EPTS to select who gets the best quality kidneys, right? We have that like younger age, less dialysis, you know, less diabetes. We sort of group all those individuals and we give them the, um, the better kidneys, if we had a way of deciding who gets these higher KDPI kidneys, not like at Yale we only reserve them for older individuals with shorter waiting time, in New York they give them to everybody. If we had a way to make that population more homogeneous, they would look more like apples and apples and then you could compare and say, okay, outcomes at Henry Ford with high KDPI kidneys is 87% at one year, at Yale it's 85% at one year and you guys are doing a better job. Right? We don't do that because we just put them into anybody and there's no, so I think that would improve the way we're viewed. Now, would that be better for the system at large? I think that's a, large, a more difficult question. Um, well, I think to, if you want me to answer that question, like my personal belief, I believe it's yes. Okay. But I'll tell you why I get there. And I don't think it's there now. But we're working on this project at Yale with a pathologist called multi-photon microscopy. Right? And it's a way of using a laser to capture the image of a whole biopsy slice. 
And what's the value to that? The value to that is we can process it faster, we can, we can get it up on the internet so you guys can all see it. There's all these other values. But there's one other value. What really, and this is what I just learned from the pathologist, like if you thought about people whose job is jeopardized by technology, it's, it's pathologists and radiologists, right? Because you can use machines to read these things quickly. And what prevents you from reading a biopsy is not the technology, it's the preparation of the slide. So apparently this AI technology doesn't work well if the slide's not perfectly flat and all that kind of stuff, and that's what this multi-photon stuff does. So by analogy, if we could get to a point where you could really load in data in a way that was reproducible, like we all agreed what heart disease was, then I do think AI could be something that we would use to make better decisions. The problem is if what I call heart disease and what you call heart disease are two different things and the machine's just looking for heart disease, you know, at a very simplistic level, I realize I can go more, then I think that's the challenge, right? Thank you uh, right. for Mike and Liz. Thanks a lot.